Chapter 10, Misdirection. When I opened my eyes, I was outdoors. It was daytime and bright. I had to shield my eyes from the sun. I didn't know where I was. It didn't look like New York City. There were people all around me. There must have been hundreds of them, and they were all staring at me. Buzzing with conversation and excitement, I looked around quickly for clues. There were lots of tall buildings. I was downtown in a big city somewhere, but I didn't know where. It sure didn't seem like the 21st century. All the men were wearing those old-time hats that I'd seen in the movies. Nobody wears those hats anymore. I scanned the advertising signs, Coffee, Five Cents, Chevrolet, Bromo Seltzer, Gaty Theater, Lowe's State. A movie theater was playing something called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. A street sign read Mr. Er, read McGee. I didn't remember any McGee Street in New York. Three tall guys walked over to me. One wore glasses and one had, a, had on some sort of military uniform. He had a pleasant smile on his face. Where am I? I asked. Ha 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 ha, laughed the guy in the uniform. Very funny. He said it as if it was totally obvious where I was. Kansas City, of course, said the guy with glasses. I noticed the big sign overhead, Kansas City Star. That must be the name of the local newspaper. I looked down to see that I didn't have on my regular clothes. I was wearing a pair of striped pants, black shoes, a white shirt, and a jacket and tie. I would never have picked out these clothes, and I hate wearing a tie. Are you ready? asked the guy in the uniform. Ready for what? I asked. He laughed again. What's happening? I demanded. What am I doing here? What year is it? It's 1921, of course, said the guy with glasses. So Houdini had done it. He had somehow pulled off metamorphosis, just like he said he would, and sent me to Kansas City a hundred years in the past. I wondered where he was. Maybe he was sitting in my house at the same instant, watching my TV or playing with my computer. I took a deep breath. I had known that metamorphosis was going to happen, but it was still a shock to my system. Can I have a mirror? I asked the guys. Get the man a mirror, barked the guy in the military uniform. In seconds, somebody hustled over with one of those little circular mirrors that ladies use to put on their makeup. He handed it to me, and I looked at myself. Oh, oh no, I was Houdini. My head was big, with piercing, penetrating blue-gray eyes that looked almost frightening. My hair was thick, bushy, and curly, and parted in the middle. My forehead was big, my eyebrows were wide, and my chin and cheekbones were sharp. I didn't look anything like the real me, and I was a grown man. Not that grown. The three guys around me were all much bigger. I couldn't have been taller than five foot six. My legs seemed a little bow-legged. I knew Houdini was a short man. That was one of the advantages he had when it came to escaping from enclosed spaces. Are you okay, Mr. Houdini? asked the guy in the uniform. You look a little under the weather. I need to sit down for a moment, I said, to catch my breath. Get Houdini a chair, barked the guy in the uniform. Somebody rushed over with a wooden folding chair. I sat down heavily and put my hand, my head in my hands, trying to clear it. How did I get into this, and how was I going to get back home? As I was looking at the ground, I noticed a sheet of paper beneath my feet. I picked it up and flipped it over. Oh, no. This was bad. This was real bad. You may not even know what a straitjacket is. Houdini got his start by escaping from handcuffs and manacles. But after a few years, people got bored watching that. They wanted something more exciting, 
and they didn't want to sit around for an hour waiting for him to open the handcuffs. So he started dreaming up other escapes. He was constantly trying to top himself to keep the public interested. At some point, Houdini visited an insane asylum and saw inmates constrained in these heavy canvas jackets. He knew immediately that that could be his next escape. A guy holding a big white megaphone addressed the crowd. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, he announced. Thanks to the good folks at the Kansas City Star, I would like to welcome to our fair city, the king of handcuffs, the master of manacles, the amazing Harry Houdini. The crowd erupted in applause and hat waving. For your entertainment and amazement, the megaphone man continued, the great Houdini, who will be appearing at the Orpheum Theater tonight and tomorrow night, will perform for free for you a feat which at one time was thought to be utterly impossible, that of escaping from a regulation straitjacket. Do you think he can do it? The crowd hollered back a chorus of yeses and noes. Well, there's only one way to find out, the megaphone man continued. Stay right where you are. You will not want to miss this. Here is the greatest escapologist in the world, the man who makes the impossible seem possible. The one, the only, Harry Houdini. More applause and hat waving. I have to admit, it was kind of cool hearing all those people cheering for me. I had never experienced anything like it. I felt very alive. Take a bow, Mr. Houdini, the guy in the military uniform whispered in my ear. I stood up, bowed, and waved to the crowd. That made them cheer even louder. But I was scared. I was also mad. Houdini never told me I'd have to do an escape as part of my metamorphosis. He just said I would be the most famous man in the world, and now there was nothing I could do about it. It was a classic magician's misdirection. The three guys helped me take off my jacket and tie. Then they picked up a straight jacket and draped it over my shoulders. Backward, with the opening behind me. This is all a big mistake, I protested. I'm not really Houdini. I'm just a kid. Ha 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 ha, laughed the guy in the uniform. You are a funny man, Mr. Houdini. The straight jacket was made of very heavy brown canvas with a leather collar and leather cuffs. The sleeves were about twice as long as regular sleeves and sewn up to close off at the ends. It was like putting your arms into two cloth sacks. The sleeves were overlapped so that my arms were crossed in front of me. At the end of each sleeve was a leather strap that wrapped around my body so the two sleeves met behind me and buckled in the back. Another strap was passed underneath between my legs and also buckled in the back. There were rivets at various points to prevent the fabric from being torn. I was in big trouble. The only good thing about this escape, I suppose, was that I wouldn't have to pick a lock or hide a key inside part of my body. This is all a mistake, I said as two of the guys grabbed me in a bear hug while the other guy stuck his knee against my back so he could pull the straps as tight as possible. Let me explain. The three of them laughed. Come on, Mr. Houdini, said the guy with glasses. I know you've done this a hundred times before. But, but, I was wrapped up tight. This couldn't be happening. I had read a little bit about how Houdini escaped from straitjackets, but I never thought I would have to do it myself. How could I possibly get out of this situation? While they were buckling me up, another guy came over, lugging a long cable with a thick padded length of cloth at the end of it. He wrapped the cloth around my ankles and tied my legs together with it. What are you doing that for? I asked. So we can hoist you up in the air, of course, he replied. Wait, what? I said, my voice rising. You mean I've got to get out of this thing upside down? Of course, the guy said. How else could all these people see you? But I'm afraid of heights, I said. Ha 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 ha, very funny, said the guy in the military uniform. You know the drill, Houdini, said the guy with the glasses. I actually did know the drill. I had seen videos of Houdini doing this stunt on YouTube. Usually, he performed his escapes behind a curtain, so the audience couldn't see how he did it. 
The straight jacket escape was the only outdoor stunt he did in full view of an audience. It was his brother Hardeen, who was also a magician, who suggested it would be more dramatic if the audience could watch him struggle. Oh, they were going to see a struggle, all right. Maestro, shouted the guy with the big megaphone. A little music, please. Somewhere, a band started playing. The guys lowered the upper part of my body down, so I was lying on the ground. Somebody gave a signal, and the cable started slowly pulling my legs up. The cable must have been attached to a pulley on the roof of the building. A guy on the street was pulling me up as my legs lifted off the ground. The guys held my upper body so that all my weight would, be, would not be on my head. I closed my eyes. I was upside down now, being pulled up in the air. As more and more people could see me rising up, the crowd roared its approval. Help! I shouted. Help! People were laughing. I'm not joking, I shouted. Get me out of here. I could feel myself rising higher and higher. I could already feel the blood rushing to my head. When I opened my eyes, I could see windows of the office buildings filled with people. I was about the same level as the Kansas City star sign, nine stories up. That was on purpose, I'm sure. Photographers were leaning out of the windows, trying to get a shot of me with a sign in the background. I was just hanging there. That's when I started to cry. I couldn't help it. It just came over me. I don't think the people below could see it, but I was helpless, useless, and scared. I couldn't even move my arms to wipe the tears away. They collected in my eyebrows. I tried to remember some of the things Houdini had texted me. We are all afraid of something. You cannot get past fear unless you confront it. If you can do that, you can accomplish what appears to be impossible. I looked down. There must have been thousands of people below craning their necks to look up at me. They were standing so tightly together that none of them would have been able to sit down if they wanted to. I could also see lots of old, old, old time cars and trolleys, plus a few horse and buggies scattered around the blocks surrounding the Kansas City Star Building. People were leaning out of windows, waving, perched precariously on ledges, and wrapped around telephone poles. I remember something else Houdini had texted me. If I can escape, he said, people feel they can escape from the thing they fear. I gave people hope. Snap out of it, I told myself. I had to get past my fear of heights and face it. It was time to get to work. I knew from reading books that one of the ways Houdini got out of the straitjacket was to intentionally dislocate his shoulder. Well, I wasn't about to do that. I was going to have to get out of this thing on my own. I pushed my arms out against the straitjacket as hard as I could, grunting from the effort. Nothing. That got me nowhere, as expected. The straight jacket was wrapped pretty tightly, but even so, there was just a little slack in the cloth. That, I knew, was another one of Houdini's secrets. As they were putting a straight jacket on him, he would take a deep breath to expand his chest as much as he could. At the same time, he would hunch his shoulders and hold his arms just a little bit away from his sides. That gave him a tiny bit of slack to work with, and that was all he needed. Instinctively, I had done the same thing when they put the straight jacket on me. So when I expelled all the air in my lungs, there was some slack in the cloth. Using as much power as I could muster, I pushed my elbows down against my knees to get a little more room to allow me to lift my arms up. I jammed my right elbow upward until it was closer to my face. I figured that if I could get one arm near my head, I might be able to unbuckle a strap with my teeth. I was already sweating and exhausted from struggling. You can do it, Houdini, somebody shouted from below. You can do anything. It occurred to me that being upside down may have actually been an advantage. Gravity made it easier for me to push my arm above my head. I somehow managed to force one elbow to the top of the straitjacket. Once my wrist was close enough to my face, I got to work loosening the buckle with my teeth. It wasn't easy. The rope was twisting while I was thrashing and bending from the waist. I knew I was running out of time. I could feel the blood rushing to my head. Soon, I knew I would become unconscious. I was grunting, sweating, and flailing as I worked on the buckle with my mouth. 
The crowd below was loving it, yelling and screaming and urging me on. They seemed to enjoy watching me struggle. I remembered what Houdini had texted me about escape. Everybody wants to escape from something. Human beings all want something different than what we have, something better. I guess that's what motivated us to send a man to the moon, to cure diseases, to invent new machines, or simply to get better, a better job and earn more money to make our lives easier. We all want to escape from who we are. Then we get a, to a new place and we want to escape from there. I managed to get the first buckle open with my teeth, but the wind was picking up, which caused the cable to sway back and forth like a pendulum. On each swing, I was getting dangerously close to a concrete window ledge. My head almost banged against it. The crowd gasped every time I swung close to the edge. Houdini probably loved when this happened, I figured. Me? I hated every second of it. I kept on grunting, sweating, and flailing around wildly as I worked to free my arms. Finally, after what felt like 20 minutes, but was probably closer to 10, I was able to jerk my head and neck to get my arms out of the jacket. At that point, I could reach my back. Even though my hands were still trapped in the sleeves, I was able to feel through the sleeves to work on the other buckles. One by one, I got them loose. That was it. I ripped the jacket off my body and held my arms out on both sides, like a cross. The crowd went nuts. Finally, with a flourish, I dropped the straight jacket into the crowd below. There was cheering like I'd never heard in my life. I don't remember what happened after that. I must have passed out.